Let's now take a look at ancient Egypt and their diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Do we have a clicker? I will see if I can find it. Because I want to stand there. I know. You're the best. Point. Green point. I feel like since the beginning, some people have started uh, sitting down. Which I want to do too, but I'm not going to. Here. Thank you. Oh, wait, you have to look it up. Now, Okay, so I did my uh, paper on ancient Egyptian diplomacy and sort of just how they could cover all aspects of diplomacy from friendly relations to other countries to even sort of subjugation and tense relationships with other countries. So, most of this... Uh, discussion of diplomacy comes from the Amarna tablets or the Amarna letters, which were usually between Egypt and Babylon. Hey, Christian. Uh, and I'm not sure which are which. They're... Oh. Anyway, uh, I cover friendly Egyptian diplomacy, neutral diplomacy, tense diplomacy, and more specifically, the first binational treaty, uh, I guess, in recorded human existence. So... This first Amarna letter that I worked with was the Amarna letter from Bernaburiash, the king of Babylon, to, uh, oh, I think it was one of the Ramses, I'm not sure. So, this letter is really interesting in that it shows this clear subjugation to Egypt at the time. It seems that these people were, like, weaker than Egypt at the time. They were wanting to be on friendly terms. They were begging for merchant safety at the time, because it seems that um, Egyptian... Raiders would actually constantly be hitting their caravans and merchants as they were coming through. So they were saying, well, you're, if you want us to be able to trade with you effectively, we need your protection. So they were begging for Egyptian protection at this time, which really shows a clear hierarchy who's in control in this relationship. So they do threaten to leave, but it's not like a, it's not like a threat and like, oh, we're going to be enemies. It's just like, we're not going to trade with you anymore. Just nervousness. Here's an uh, excerpt from the text. So, uh, I think they actually found specific people who were like abusing the merchants as they were coming in. And he, he apparently had been trying to communicate with the Egyptian pharaoh for a while, saying, like, we've sent people to you and you still haven't been dealing with us. We really need your help. So, they right here they do threaten to discontinue relationships with Egypt, even though that's kind of an empty threat, because Egypt, I imagine at this time, has a bit more of an upper hand. They, just, they probably could say, well, guess what, you don't get to leave. But that was just their, uh, that, that was just them in their diplomacy showing that they had the ability to control other countries with their uh, military and political strength. The second Amarna letter that I discussed kind of puts them more on equal footing. It's to Kadeshman, king of Babylon. It's, he's a different king from a different period. And it's, it's clearly tense. These two countries are trying to sort of incorporate into each other, trying to become amicable, but they don't exactly trust each other. And it seems to be a diplomatic standoff between the two nations. And they're wanting to exchange bribes, but apparently Egypt isn't wanting to send over a bribe to Babylon, even though... Babylon has already sent over like a royal marriage to them, and to, this was usually a great way to incorporate nations into each other. They become more of a collective rather than two different nations. We actually also did this in feudal times, but here it seems that it, it was like Egypt's wouldn't uh, Egyptians wouldn't want to lower themselves to send away their royalty to other people. That's what the uh, the Babylonians felt like. They felt insulted that they weren't being sent. Well, they should. Be. Yeah. So it seems just to be like two nations unsure about their relationship, trying to make the relationship more amicable, but Egypt still having the upper hand in whether or not that actually happens. So here's a bit of the, uh, the tension. How is it possible having written to you in order to ask you for the hand of your daughter? Oh, my brother, you should have written me using such language, telling me that you will not give her to me, as since earliest times no daughter of the king of Egypt has ever been given in marriage. So that's like... That's just a, a introduction to 
sort of how the relationship is working currently. I thought it was like a little, it made me kind of nervous just to read it, thinking about, wow, they, they could really get in trouble over just this kind of, what, I, what seems to me to be a not important issue. But it was still a cool way that they handled diplomacy and how their diplomacy could often get a little complex. And now this final one is even more tense. It is like, oh, <laughs> um, it's almost hostile in the language that they use. They flat out say, hey, we aren't friends, basically is the equivalent of the language used in part of the letter. They are giving gifts to each other in this letter. It starts off like, all right, I'm going to send you some lapis lazuli. You're going to send me some gold. We're going to be allies, but we aren't really. Our dads were allies, but we aren't really great friends. And these, uh, this first part right here is just them mentioning the histories of their countries and how they were technically allies and how, I, I believe it was between, oh, Supil, I can't remember his name, and, uh, and the king of Babylon and Akhenaten. And Akhenaten wasn't exactly being very forthcoming with... Yeah, no, Su Supalu Laluma mm -hmm. is a Hittite king. Mm -hmm. So that's in Turkey. It's in Turkey, yeah. Oh, wait, no. It might not be Akhenaten. I'll have to check that again. Uh, I'll, I'll fix this. Ramsey. Ran yes. Second, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so here in this... Yeah, that, that, that's actually totally correct. And here at this later part portion of the letter... Uh, they, I'm trying to find where it is. Why have you put the name of, of my brother above my name, and who is it who troubles the good relationships between us? How has, <laughs> who, have, uh, my brother, have you written to me thinking that we have become allies? So, it's, I, I just thought this was interesting because it shows that at this time, even though it was, even though it was common for these nations to be, um, like, normally this kind of insult would already have a nation put up war yet. They're still managing this diplomacy in hostile relationships with other countries, which is kind of like a modern thing we do today. I like the last line. Yeah. <laughs> I have no better thought of than a cadaver. <laughs> but your name I rub out. <laughs> good. And yet they still weren't killing each other at the time. So it, it's yes. just yet. And here I uh, move into the a more focused look at the first binational treaty between Ramses II and uh, Hattusili III of Babylon. So the, it's separated into like several groupings. In the first grouping, it establishes the royal lineage of both kingdoms and their legitimacy, uh, legitimacy to be talking to each other. So it lists the ancestors of Hattusili, it emphasizes his uh, right to rule Babylon, and then it lists, or rather, uh, Hittites. Then it lists the ancestors of Ramses II and emphasizes his right to rule the Egyptians. So just like um, a historical document at the beginning saying, yes, these are both, uh, th these people are both acknowledging that they are in control of their nations at the time. It's nothing like that was not officially settled. And then the second part of the, uh, of the, uh, the tablet discusses sort of divine appeals and how there is a Hittite version of the Divine Appeals and a Egyptian version of the Divine Appeals. And the Hittite version is, like, short. It's, like, you'll see it in a little bit. And the Egyptian version is, is, is not so short. So <laughs> here's the Hittite version of the Divine Appeals. They say, uh, <laughs> they say we use uh, the Egyptian god Re and our own Hittite god. And then the Egyptian version lists every single god in their temple as, like, establishing the peace between the nations. And I thought that was just an interesting cultural mm -hmm. view of, uh, of how they worked their diplomacy. And the third section of the tablet is promises made from nation to nation. And both nations said that our armies will defend each other as long as the treaty is active. If one nation goes to war, the other nation will immediately join that nation and fight with them. If... Uh, and then, of course, they'll have fair dealing and trade as they are sharing their resources. And then there's also the sharing of legal treatment. So if a criminal commits a crime in either country, that criminal must be turned over to by both countries to face punishment. They cannot seek asylum in that country. So you couldn't have, like, an Egyptian priest do something and then run away to Babylon and then live his life there. 
Babylon would, or rather the Hittite Empire would have to turn over that priest. Extradition. Yeah, extradition. So the history of this excavation of the Amarna letters was mostly done by this guy named uh, Alexander Jorgen Alexander Knudsen. So he actually translated letters, I believe, into oh, a Scandinavian, I think. And then every other text was sort of taken from what he did, his work on it, and then translated into other languages. So the other uh, final text, the Binational Treaty, was actually found in multiple places. It was found in both Turkey and in Egypt. And the Egyptian version was found at the Temple of Karnak at Amun-Ra. And it, and it took up a large portion of the temple wall. And a, uh, a archaeologist named Jean-Francois Champollion, who we've heard about before, copied sections of the walls, made rubbings of the walls, and then worked on translating them back in France, I believe. Or was it Belgium? I'll have to check that out. I think France. And then the Hittite version, it's not nearly as well preserved. You, you can see it's just giant chunks missing of it. This, uh, this glass piece is what they thought the rest of it would look like. And... It was found in modern-day Turkey, and they kind of just were able to infer from the pieces that were left over, oh, this is what they meant. It was made out of this sort of clay plate that had been baked, and then, like, I, I think they found, like, burnt pieces on it and something like that. It, was, it had been in a, temp, a, 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 a sort of abandoned temple site. It was found and studied by German archaeologist Hugo Winkler, who, that's a very unfortunate name, and... Um, he worked on translation. I believe he was more of an Assyriologist than a uh, than a Egyptologist, but he combined his resources with Egyptologists to sort of show this really interesting a site treaty. called Hattusis. Yeah, the capital. Mm -hmm. So you can see that in the uh, museum in Istanbul, mm -hmm. and that's my work site. Any questions? Very good. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Good job. <clears throat> Our next presentation, monotheism, polytheism, Christian. So I named the title of my presentation Jewish Monotheism versus Ancient Egyptian Polytheism. A lot of my research is more, mostly based on, on the culture and the religion of both of them and kind of how they both were started and formed. I did kind of briefly mention monotheism, polytheism in my paper as a way of describing who they uh, believed as their higher authority, basically. So, as we get in here, there's three questions that can arise from this, um, from their close geographic proximity to each other. So as you can see here, we got two pictures of what each one looks like in the modern day. I couldn't really find any, anything exactly from any ancient, uh, maybe photo not photographs, of course they wouldn't have photographs back then, but any kind of pictures or anything that might describe what it might have looked like. Anything that they might have had was kind of very old and, you know, it's, it's hard to really tell what it exactly might have looked like at the time. So some of the questions that I came up with, um, how did the Jews and Egyptians affect each other before the Exodus? Did the Egyptians come up with monotheism before the Jews? Uh, and what do they have in common? Uh, a couple of these are kind of just rhetorical questions that I had for up here for discussion, if anybody wants to discuss it. The third one, what do they have in common? Uh, one thing that I do know they have in common is they also appeal to a, a high authority, regardless of who they were, um, regardless of where they came from. They both appeal to a higher authority, regardless if they had many gods or just one god. So as we continue to go into this, um, ancient Egyptian culture. So according to the research that I did, it started in 5500 BC or the prehistoric times or the really early pre-dynastic periods. Uh, there's also some other research that I was doing that I was noticing that supposedly there was a guy in the 17 or 1800s considered that creation started in the year 4007 BC, which doesn't exactly quite line up with this, so there's no evidence for sure that that's when creation was, but uh, according to my research, e ancient Egypt started... How about Bishop Usher? Bishop Usher, is that his name? He had a chronology. Yeah. 
Okay, so according to the research that I did, it started around 5500 BC, and what we know to be clear is that it ended around 30 BC, around the time of the Roman Empire. And one of the things that kind of really brought up the rise to uh, the Egyptian culture was technology. Technology, there was multiple things that I will be alluding to later on in the presentation of what some of that technology was, but that was a big thing that helped Egypt step onto the stage. Um, the last ruler of Egypt was Cleopatra VII, and this marked the end of the ancient Egyptian era. This marked it as um, not, this was not in the New Kingdom, because obviously, as we've also done from our video assignments recently, that the New Kingdom ended with what was probably the collapse of civilization, uh, even though Egypt continued on much farther than even that. So, this is the last ruler of the ancient world of Egypt, as we know before. Roman period. Definitely made a scene on the stage. So now let's talk about Jewish culture. So, as we know from the Bible, that the Jewish culture started with the patriarchs and started with Abraham as a, the covenant between God and Abraham. And it was the, uh, the descendants, the promise of the descendants that would further uh, the further blessing throughout the entire world. Um, as you can see here, as I've noted the three patriarchs, uh, I briefly mentioned Isaac, he trusted in his father Abraham to sacrifice without a lamb. Jacob name changed Israel. And basically the 12 sons and Jacob with Joseph ended up leading them to Israel. Not to Israel. Did I say that? Put Israel in there. I meant to say Egypt. So this is how they end up in Egypt, and many of their descendants are, are as we can see in the Exodus and how they come out of that. So religion in ancient Egypt. So they were really obsessed with life and the continuation of it, as you can see from pictures and other history. It may seem like they're more obsessed with death, but they're really more obsessed with life and the continuation of it in the afterlife. Magic was a big part of the culture. It told the creation story of the god Adam, who spoke creation into existence by magic, according to their uh, their their origin story, and that's why basically you can see magic in the Exodus. If you look at Exodus, why they tried using magic to counteract some of the miracles that Moses did, and that is where a lot of the magic comes from, or their belief in magic. The religion taught that the soul was composed of nine parts. I did not list them in here, but I did list them in my paper, what those nine parts were. Um, technological advances. So there were a lot of different technological advances that led to the rise of ancient Egypt, and that was the papyrus um, right here, a lot of what they used to write things down. The ramp, the lucker, the mathematics and geometry, that's basically how a lot of the pyramids and other archaeological structures are still standing today, was due to geometry. And another thing was the astronomy. Astronomy was something that they looked to. The, obviously, they didn't have telescopes back then to look up at the stars, but they had different ways of looking at the stars back in the ancient world. Uh, religion in ancient Israel. So, like I said, started with Abraham. And it was with circumcision, and this was to mark Israel separate from the rest of the world. Uh, the first ritual done was in Egypt. Uh, it was as a plague to wipe out the firstborn who did not have the blood over their doorposts. This was the first observance of one of the rituals that, e not Egypt, but Israel had done. And it started in Egypt. Uh, what we see next throughout the history of Israel is the Ten Commandments, and that was the law that was given to Moses on stone tablets for Israel to follow after. Um, you probably can't see the law of what was right and what was wrong. So this was their religion. This is their God, monotheism. Uh, this was, they believed in one God, and that was, the, was their creator of the universe, them, and everything, the one who made the covenant with them. Versus ancient Egypt, they had many different gods that were polytheistic throughout the throughout their history. And Israel believed only in one. So these are my sources. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions about anything? All right. Thank you. All right.
<clears throat> Thank you. All right, medicine. Yes, medicine. So, I did my paper on the history of ancient Egyptian medicine of surgery. But in order to get into surgery, I kind of had to go a little bit just into their medicine because their concept of medicine is very different than ours. So you have to go a little bit into that first. So first a little bit about the people of Egypt. When they were, um, when we try to look back onto them, it can be really easy to like either give them way too much credit or give them not enough credit. So like the people who think that the aliens came and planned the pyramids don't give the Egyptians enough credit, but the people who think that the Egyptians secretly cured all diseases and hid it in the pyramids, they give the Egyptians too much credit. I sleep under a pyramid. <laughs> so, it cures everything. Yeah. Crazy people out there. But um, <laughs> some people do the same thing with um, like the medical discoveries of the Egyptians. Some people unfairly act like all Egyptian medicine was just voodoo and magic and it had no real like substance to it. And other people treat Egyptian medicine like it was purely all scientific, which is not really an accurate um, way to look at that either. So yeah, it's not really either one of these. It's not um, all just magic and voodoo that they believe was medicine, and it's not all exact science that they believe was medicine. It was really a pretty good blend of both. And if you try to look at one and not the other when you look at medicine, you kind of lose um, touch with who the actual Egyptian uh, physicians were, because they were um, very religious people, even though they were the doctors. Like. In our culture, our doctors typically are either like religious or they are super, super, super non-religious. So that wasn't really the case in Egypt. The physicians were involved in the religion, and they had to be because a lot of their healing was based on their religion. So what were the Egyptians' classical approaches to medicine? They had two approaches, the magical and the scientific. So the magical was kind of like the less precise and it didn't really follow a strict set of rules. It followed the traditions and some of their theological ideologies, not necessarily anything that they had proven to work. Um, so this could include rec reciting some kind of like spell or chanting some incantation that they thought was going to make things better. Um, they have one to heal a cold. So that was kind of funny because like we still can't heal the common cold, but they really thought this worked, so they did it whenever they got a cold. And then you also have the scientific, which would be where they would look at the symptoms and they would actually like palpate wounds, so they would like touch a cut and try to figure out, well, what caused this cut? What can I put on it to make it better? How can I stitch it up? So an example of that would be like a laceration on the head, and they had specific instructions on how you were to stitch it up and cover it so that it wouldn't get infected. So one example of magical, this is the incantation for the cold. And it actually is very intense when you think about it for a cold. May you flow out uh, Karthath, son of Karthath, who breaks the bones, who destroys the skulls, who hacks in the marrow, who causes the seven openings in the head to ache. If you actually count, they count like your eyes and ears and everything, it's the seven openings of your face. So if you think about it, they're just talking about how their head hurts because they have cold. Um, so this was a spell that they thought would help um, dispel the cold. And then another part of the magical treatments is they would either carry around amulets or they would give them to um, people. And obviously this is a very fancy version of an amulet. But the Eye of Horus was a very common one for medicinal practitioners to use because like the ratios of it were thought to have some kind of healing power. So another part of the magical um, side of their medicine was their religious belief in Sekhmet, which was the lioness head goddess, and she was uh, related to medicine because of her ability to heal. Um, 
So she was the uh, goddess that medical professionals would call on if they were like not sure what to do or if they were trying to call on um, supernatural help with a medical case. So how do we really know what the Egyptians believed about medicine? Uh, most of our assumptions come directly from 12 different sets of medical papyri. And the medical papyri, again, are just like documents that were written down on papyrus at some point, and they were preserved well enough that we were able to find them and piece them back together and figure out what they were saying. So most of them had instructions for magical or scientific treatments for ailments, as well as how to diagnose and give a prognosis. So I could diagnose um, someone with a head injury, and then I could give them a poor prognosis, meaning they're probably not going to live. So there were a lot of sets of instructions like that within the medical papyri that told someone how to tell how bad an injury was and whether or not that should lead to treatment. So what kind of illnesses were they facing in um, ancient Egypt? So they would have had a lot of these same illnesses we have today. They had widespread tuberculosis. It was kind of a big issue, like people were just dying left and right of that. Mm -hmm. um, they also had heart disease, which was interesting because heart disease is generally associated with um, high sugar, high carb, high meat, um, which is not really a big part of the Egyptian diet. And so when I researched more into that, it turns out that most of the people dying of heart disease were the rich people who were eating the offerings that were being brought to the temples. And so the best meats and all that, they were eating them and then they were dying of heart attacks. So um, that's one thing that some of the royal physicians would have had to deal with more often. Um, they would have to deal with a lot of common infections that would not go away because they didn't have antibiotics and stuff like that. So if you got an ear infection, you could just get a fever and die, and that would be the end of you. Malaria was also a problem just because of what region we're in um, globally. And then dental caries, which are just cavities. And I thought this was really interesting. They had a lot of problems with cavities, and they actually had people who were like doctors of the teeth, but they weren't really dentists. So they didn't like fix people's teeth. They just would stop <coughs> if you had like a giant abscess. They would deal with that. And cavities were such a big problem in Egypt that they actually came up with what would have been kind of like the first breath mint. They mixed together like myrrh, frankincense, and a couple other things, and they made them into little pellets so that you didn't have to smell everyone's bad breath. Mm. So the two most famous medical papyri that um, I looked at were the Everest papyrus and the Edwin Smith surgical papyrus. And so the Everest papyrus was from about uh, 3000 BC, which would have been right around Egypt's first dynasty. So this one's thought to be the oldest. Um, it was 20 meters long and 30 centimeters wide, and it was very, very large in what we would consider, but they wouldn't have seen that as being too large to have something so valuable on it, because this would have been a general medical guide on how to deal with almost things from head to toe. Like it told uh, medical professionals how to deal with someone who was having a headache, how to deal with someone whose toes were falling off, how to deal with someone who has a stomach ache. And so these were kind of separated topically so that they could figure out what they needed. And then the Edwin Smith was the one that I focused a little bit more on because it was called the Edwin Smith Surgical Papyrus, which is slightly misleading, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But it was technically written in 1600 BC, which would have been sort of near the um, New Kingdom. However, it was most likely a rewrite of a much older text because the Edwin Smith uh, papyrus has almost like footnotes that follow every single entry that are trying to translate it from some older version of Egyptian language to a newer version because it was almost like archaic language even for them. So um, this one was a much shorter, it was only five meters long of papyrus, and it contained um, mostly instructions on how to deal with head injuries because the idea was that it was going to start with the head and end up at the toes, but it died off somewhere right around the chest, 
and the scrub just stopped writing. He didn't run out of paper, he had more space, he just stopped writing in the middle of the sentence. So we're not really sure why. Died. <laughs> so, another really important thing that we can learn from these medical papyri about their ideas on medicine is what were their steps to diagnose and treat illnesses. So the physician always went through a process of examining the patient. He would check the pulse. Now, Egyptians had no reliable way to measure short periods of time. So they couldn't like check your pulse for 30 seconds and then know like what your pulse rate was. So it's still unknown why they checked people's pulses other than maybe to make sure they had one because like they were, they had no way of counting it reliably, but they always made sure that somebody had a pulse. They would check for any physical manifestation of an illness. So if you had like a rash or a fever, or if you said your stomach hurt, like they were gonna feel anything that you said felt weird, just to see what they could get out of it. Then because Egyptian medicine is half spiritual and half scientific, they would also ask you if you had made anyone mad recently, or if you had any enemies, because they needed to know. <laughs> They needed to know where they needed to give you a medicine or an amulet because they didn't know what kind of sickness was attacking you. So they wanted to uh, rule out any other possibility other than the physical before they tried to give you some weird concoction. So this is a not so great image of the Edwin Smith surgical papyrus. And um, this is where a lot of that um, instructional information was coming from, the three steps that we were going through. So once he had all this information, he would again physically like palpate, so feel uh, whatever the injury was, like feel the fever, how hot was the fever, um, how swollen was that person's ankle. And so depending on what ailment the person was suffering from, he would categorize it into one of three categories, treatable, untreatable or fightable and so okay yeah. I was say, were all the medical texts in demotic um all the ones that the two main ones that i looked at were and they were translated into hieroglyphics and then into other languages um but i believe for the most part they were just because it was easier to store that way um yes so the three categories were treatable untreatable and fightable Fine. and that became important because doctors were business people, and if you had an untreatable condition, they just kind of told you to go home and you died. Because if you died under their care, that looked really bad for them, and they needed people to come see them. It's bad PR. It's it is bad PR if someone dies dies at your doctor's office. So they pretty much had instructions to the doctors telling them that you should abandon patients whose fate is certain. So even if you've been treating someone and you think they're going to die, you should just stop treating them because then they don't die under your care. Which is kind of bad, but explains Egyptian doctor's mortality. Do it now, we just cut off your insurance. Yeah, they do that too. <laughs> yes, so that's why those prognosises were so important. If you were treatable, fightable, or untreatable. Because if you were treatable or fightable, fightable kind of meant that the doctor would fight whatever illness you were working with, and he knew that it might not work, but he was pretty sure he had a shot. But if, if he, the doctor didn't think they had a shot at beating your illness, you were just kind of left for dead. So back to the surgery thing, which is what the um, I was trying to get at with the paper. The question was, was there ever really surgery in Egypt? Because a lot of people freak out and they're like, oh my gosh, Egypt was the first place there ever was surgery, and yeah. that's so cool. But there's a pretty decent debate to be had about whether there really was, because we know that there was suturing, so they stitched people up, but they didn't necessarily cause the cuts that they were stitching. They were stitching up cuts that happened from rocks falling on people's heads and things like that. So the claim that they were able to perform simple surgeries, especially amputations, was um, pretty popular for a while, especially. And so... There are some people who claim that those didn't happen. And so one reason that the original claim that there were amputations going on in Egypt uh, was even made was because um, the surgeon of Napoleon, his name was uh, Larry, he's got a fun name, 
he saw these um, hieroglyphs or similar ones in a temple when he was there. And so he thought all of these <laughs> were um, amputation. He thought all of these were things getting cut off or something that was cut off already. And so he went back and said, wow, they're doing amazing surgery in Egypt. Like, this is great. They're doing amputations. And so he went and delivered that news. And then we were kind of like confused because we can't find anybody who was mummified and had a amputation. We can't find, we find like two examples and both of them suffered from severe crush injuries, indicating they probably had their limbs cut off because they were being pinned by a rock, not because it was some kind of surgical necessity. So um, this actually connects to the diplomatic um, thing you said earlier. Um, Ramses II actually made an agreement to quit cutting off people's hands and phalluses because that's what he would do when people lost. And then they would count them to see how many people they killed. So uh, Ramses II made a nice diplomatic agreement to stop doing that to people. But then Ramses III had this painted next to his temple, which says that agreement may not have gone so well. So... Again, there have been plenty of mummies found that are missing fingers, hands, feet, or hands, feet, or limbs, but they are more likely the result of punishment rather than medical necessity. So, were there actually surgeons in ancient Egypt? So, this is Herodotus. He um, uh, said medicine in Egypt was on a plan of separation. Each physician was. Uh, treated a single disorder and no more. Thus the country swarms with medical practitioners, some undertaking the cure of diseases of the eye, others of the intestines, and some of which, which are not local. So basically what he was saying was, Egypt has specialized doctors that treat individual things. And so the hope was that maybe there were specialized surgeons that only dealt with cutting things off when you needed that happen, to happen. But when you look at that, um, most of the doctors in Egypt were not specialized. There were a lot that were, but compared to their contemporaries, but most of them were not. They were just general physicians who dealt with the spiritual and the science, and they just did the best they could. But no matter whether they were specialized or not, they all went to temple school for years to learn how to be physicians and how to take information and diagnose and treat. So they all would have had the basic ability of, to do surgery. Like, if you had something really weird growing off your arm, they would have been like, okay, let's cut it off. But they weren't going to actively go and try to, like, take out your colon. Like, that wasn't going to happen. They didn't know how to do those kinds of things because they didn't have that kind of um, anatomy knowledge to know how to do that without killing you because they didn't have the technology available. Now, we do know that there was basic, um, minimally invasive surgery, um, to drain abscesses or to remove a fatty tumor that was on the outside. And so again, that's kind of where the debate of, is that really surgery? Because all you did was cut something off that was pretty much hanging off. Um, so the biggest issue with even proving that these happened is the way mummified tissue gets, um, uh, not really decomposing, but as it is being preserved, you kind of lose the ability to tell if someone had a small scar from a minor operation. So um, that makes it difficult to prove. So the conclusion is that overall, the idea of having surgery in ancient Egypt is not new. People have been thinking that there was um, surgery in ancient Egypt since at least the time of uh, Napoleon, maybe even before then. So uh, this could not necessarily be because there actually was any surgery there. It could just be because of some misleading um, murals or hieroglyphics that people misinterpreted. But I think one important thing to know is that even if these um, physicians weren't surgeons, they were still really important contributors to medicine in all the things that they figured out with what little technology they had. All right. Any questions? Imagine being that guy who works for Ramses III and you're just stacking <laughs> up those uh, removed organs. <laughs> So you're talking about major surgery and minor surgery. Yes. And you know the definition of minor surgery? Somebody else is getting the surgery. If you're getting the surgery, usually think it's major. <laughs>
Egyptian concept of beauty. Yes. So I wanted to do something that I would be, I would find relevant, <laughs> um, per usual. I don't think people are surprised anymore. But <laughs> um, I. I'm not, like, that into makeup, but my sister is, so she's, like, actually studying this in school, so I thought that this would be informative for her. All right. Give her some points. That's the only transition I have in this slide. The little boy I was babysitting last night showed me how to put it in, and then I forgot, so the rest of the slides don't oh. have that fancy transition. Right. <laughs> um, for millennia, women who adorn their bodies with, women have adorned their bodies with oils, powders, and chemical and natural mixtures to draw attention to or away from their faces and bodies. So um, it's nothing new that makeup is a big thing. I don't think you guys are surprised by that because we can see them in pictures. But um, I think it really is a big part of Egyptian culture. And similar to many other body adornments, the use of makeup. Oh, I also have little takeaways if you guys want to pass those around. Sorry. It's the same slide, but um, it's just kind of the overview. Sim similar to many other body adornments, the use of makeup varies by the culture depending on what the society defines as beautiful. So um, if I were to go to Japan, something that I do there is going to be way um, differently accepted than it is here. And um, ancient Egyptian women were known for their uses of black makeup, eccentric hairstyles, and tattoos, which are the three main things that I'm going to be talking about today. And um, ancient Egyptian women who had the freedoms to decorate their faces with makeup had the confidence to do so. So maybe that was because they also had the freedoms to do certain legal things in their culture. So as we know, people say the, the classic saying, eyes are the windows to the soul, which is why um, a lot of makeup is put on the eyes. Oh. And it's even seen in the Bible. That's the why light people always think I'm dead. <laughs> the light of the body is the eye therefore your eye can be therefore it, your eye be sound your whole body shall be full of light um, it, your eyes have this universal and timeless sense of beauty that kind of carries throughout cultures and throughout times um, so it's no, no surprise that they adorned their eyes but what's interesting though is that black tends to represent death, mystery Sorrow, power, secrecy, and drama, and many other things, which I think in, there's this intense feeling that you feel when you make eye contact with somebody, um, which is, I think, a huge reason why black is heavily used on the eyes. And when women wear, like, really dark makeup, it's usually for, like, going out at, at night, too. Um, and at night, people are usually more vulnerable, whether it be, like, emotionally or physically. So I just think that that's interesting. Um, ancient Egyptians use of intense heavy eye makeup was achieved by using coal, K-O-H-L, for eyeliner, and green ma malachite for eyeshadow. Black makeup is used to enhance the eyes and eyebrows. It's also a department store. Yes, it is. Coal, which is why I don't have a picture of it, because everything I looked up <laughs> was coals. Yes. Um, so coal is the new black instead of... Ooh. Orange. Because <laughs> they're in prison. Yeah. Um, ancient Egyptians have used intense heavy eye makeup. Um, so I already said the malachite and eyeshadow. The malachite and the coal is black. Um, it, coal is a complex blend of ingredients, including crushed antimony, which is a silvery gray malatoid, metalloid. I'm sorry. It is made of burnt almonds, lead oxidized copper, ochre, 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 ash, malachite, which is the green pigment in the copper oxide, and chrysocola, 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 which is a blue-green copper ore that were combined to create a black, gray, or green pigment. And the green is actually, if you know makeup, it's actually good for darker eyes. So. It's good for dark eyes. Mm -hmm. I mean, like like there's if different you have colors. Black that... eyes. If you hit someone in the eye, you should put that on it. Just... Yeah. <laughs> there's different colors that make different eyes pop, and oh. Egyptian eye ma eyes are darker. So. Well, that's yeah. Black and brown. 
So the coal was stored and applied in a container that would look like that. Um, it had a stick-like applicator and a compartment um, that was stone, uh, made of stone, dampened with either water or oil. So they would dampen the, the stick and they would mix it and then apply it onto the eye. And as you've seen the cat eye on like Cleopatra, they would just across the lid and then up to the eyebrow. And there's um, a picture of a girl applying it. So, lovely hair. Mm -hmm, I'll talk about that later. Ancient, ancient samples of coal and eye paint show the depth and knowledge that Egyptians had about cosmetology. So they knew what colors worked with what, and it was like a part of their art too. They knew how to use colors in a palette. Um, and then for instance, Uju, derived from the green Malachite with its origins in Sinai, an area known as the spiritual dominion of Hathor, the ancient goddess of beauty, joy, love, and women, who was also known for the known as the Lady of Malachite. So they were they were not only using these to like enhance their eyes, but they were um, symbols of their spirituality. And another sample was Mesdemet, another it was a dark gray lead or made from another either sibnite, an antimony sulfide, or more typically toxic galena, and it was from the Aswan region of the Red Sea coast. They're just, they're just rubbing lead on their face. Yeah. I mean, honestly, today we use, like, really harsh chemicals, so it's really not that different, like, which is why organic makeup is such a big thing right now, but it's not as good. <laughs> um, wigs were also a really big deal, so... Girls and boys, um, before puberty, they would shave their heads and then they would leave one side long um, to prevent lice and it was just easier and the heat was really bad, so they did that. Um, but when they continued into their elder years, they would shave it completely and wear wigs. Um, women who were wealthy had access to real hair like wigs made of real hair and then women who were poor and men who were poor they would wear wigs made of I don't know if I have it on here but it was made of like vegetable like corn um like when you silk. shop corn what's that called? yeah corn silk and other random things I used to use a uh, a mop right that works just cut it and um, oh, originally worn by slaves, wigs were made into a variety of styles, long or short, but many women favored curls or waves rather than straight strands, which I thought was really interesting because every Egyptian wig that I've ever seen, like in a Halloween store, is straight. And I wonder if that's because it's cheaper to have a straight wig. I don't know. I was Cleopatra for like three years growing up because my mom didn't want to what? buy me a new costume. And the wig was straight, so I remember it. So you were Cleopatra for three years? Mm. Not Chloe Patra. Chloe Patra. <laughs> Just Cleo. Patra. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are what the wigs would have looked like. Um, this is a preserved wig from a wealthier woman, which is yeah. crazy that it's preserved. And then this is one from a poor woman. I've, I've, I've met a, a lot of people who had hair like that on the right. That's why you don't brush curly hair. <laughs> and oils are were used to maintain the wigs. So they also had like perfumey scents. It's not good. Oh, they were made of wool too. So that's probably what that is. Wool, yeah. yeah. Vegetable fibers or wool. Okay, so tattoos. This is where it gets like real spiritual. So while historians claim <laughs> tattoos were used primarily primarily to decorate the body, there is evidence that they may have had spiritual or ritual significance. Nubians may have been the first ones to introduce the practice during the Middle Kingdom, and archaeologists have uncovered female tattooed mummies with dates back to 4,000 years. And re what I found was that women, tattoos were limited to women, and not many things are limited to women in history or even today like men have access to both things um 
So I thought it was interesting that women had access, women were wearing makeup and they, they were the only ones that had tattoos from my research. Um, so I think that that shows a lot to the rights that they had and like the confidence that they had. And even if you look at Hapshetz, that's how you say it, right? I, even if she was, she was portrayed as a man, but the fact that they let a woman be in power says a lot about how women were seen in their culture. Um, so they had the boldness to wear the bold makeup that they did and the, the confidence because they had these rights. I'll talk about that more later, but, um, Amunet was the priestess of Hathor, and she was the first female tattooed mummy that we have found. She was found wearing parallel lines made of dots and dashes on her arms and thighs and an oval pattern on her belly. The tattoos on her abdomen have potential relations to a god of fertility or sexuality, and mummies uncovered from the New Kingdom convey the development of represent represent representational tattoos. Um, Bees, Bez, the god, god of war, he is actually the dwarf god. So he's yeah. in the top corner. Yeah, I thought that was funny. Yeah, he's a good god. <laughs> I don't know if he's a good god. Oh, he's, he's mischievous. Yeah. Everything that I read about him was really mean. <laughs> so I don't think he was good. <laughs> um, which is, it's funny that dwarfs are associated with, like, you know? That's not really fair. Well, <laughs> it's not their fault. <laughs> um, that's coming from a tall girl, so. Um, <laughs> he was associated with sexuality, humor, music, and dancing. Was found on the thighs of a number of women. And um, perhaps women decorated their bodies with him because he was known for protecting women and children above all others. So he did have some good things. But See, protector. I, that was the only thing. Um, and maybe he was put on their thighs as a protector because of sexual reasons. You never know if, like, he protected them from work. things. Yeah, that's true. Um, additionally, female mummies have been found with scarification patterns across their bellies. So it's not just, like, a couple that we found. It's a lot. That means girl power. Oh, okay. If you didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> um, it is apparent that the rights of freedoms, rights and freedoms bestowed upon women during a period of time, during this period of time, were closely associated to the freedom they had to use makeup and tattoos, um, and have different hairstyles instead of covering up their heads. In general, when women were oppressed, it was also con it was considered taboo or unacceptable for them to wear makeup. Even if you look at different eras of if you're, like humanities and women with less makeup in years in the church and stuff, they weren't, they didn't have those freedoms. They didn't have the, the rights that Egyptian women were allowed to have. It, but I think it's funny that like this was before that major oppression of women. And then there was like this sudden relapse, but because Egypt, Egypt was in its own little thing, it was just a whole different society. Um, while women seemed to gain independence over time, Egyptian women had a decent amount of autonomy before the decrease of women's rights, and women held the rights to own and inherit their own land and property. Um, the Wilbur, Wilbur, I'll just say that, papyrus, mm -hmm. provides evidence to that 10 to 11 percent of landowners were female, which is a lot, and controlled their own businesses. They instigated legal proceedings against men and not only did women have legal rights but jobs that required physical labor and some women were in lower classes um, worked these women who were wealthy wouldn't have but it was like acceptable for them to lift things <laughs> um, that's about it I have more references on my paper I just okay. All right. Haven't well, very, compiled very interesting. Very interesting. There's a thunderous applause. That's good. All right. Now.